Now, I hope you'll know, at least this all reminds you, that if you are solving an equation that's like a quadratic, okay, you know there are how many solutions? Two, right? Namely, x equals plus or minus five. Good. So you know when you're solving an equation, you get two solutions. But if you're asked to evaluate an expression, like root 25, you know in fact there's only one value, right? There's not two values for root 25, there's only one, okay? X is only equal, sorry, not X. Uh, this number is only five, right? It's not like, oh, sometimes it's negative five. No, 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 it's only five, okay? And the reason why this is confusing to students is because it's actually a language here that unfortunately most students never discover that helps you just sort out what's going on here, okay? Now this is worth writing. Every non-zero number, like 25, or 36, or 37, or even negatives, like negative 5. Every non-zero number has two square roots. Um, you can see why I had to pull out zero, obviously, because zero is zero, okay? So every non-zero number has two square roots, but... We designate one of those square roots as the most important one. The one that you're like, okay, this is the one I usually mean, I most frequently mean, right? And we call that guy the principal square root. You're like, okay, we've got, you know, more than one. Which one's the one that you want to talk about most frequently? Let's call that one the principal one, okay? Now you tell me, why is it that positive 5, 1? Like between 5 and negative 5, why is 5 the more natural choice? Any suggestions? Hmm. When was the first time you met square roots? Why did we need square roots at all? Yeah. The area of a square. You could do the area of a square. Or, or even like in terms of distance, right? If you're thinking of a square, this is where the Greeks worked it out. They were like, well, how far is it? on the diagonals, right? And you need to introduce square roots to do that. Good old Pythagoras, yes? Now if you're doing Pythagoras, if you're working out lengths, right? Then if there's one thing I know about lengths, they're positive, right? They are always positive. So it makes sense if you're like, well, I've got to choose one. I've got to choose one to be the important one. The positive one makes sense. Good, okay? But, it's not always so clear cut that there's an important one and a non-important one. Particularly in the complex world, every number, every non-zero number has two square roots. Which one's the most important one of this one? It's not as obvious, okay? So when you see a question like this, almost certainly you'll see it phrased in this way and you'll see the plural there, right? Uh, in the same way before, I could say, find the cube roots of a number. Find all the fourth roots or fifth roots of a number. You guys found all the cube roots of negative eight just now and there were three of them. Okay. So to do this, all we need to remember is, by definition, right? what is a square root? It's the number that if you square it, you get back that number. Okay. So how am I going to work out this guy? If the square roots of this number are some number z, if that's the square root, then if you square that, what should you get back? Negative a plus 6i, right? Now to proceed, I'm going to take advantage of the fact that I know that I can write a complex number as z that, that shows it's just one number, but I can also write it as its separate bits, right? As the real bit and the imaginary bit, right? So I can write this as a plus b i squared, right? This, I'm just separating them out so it's a little easier to work with, okay? Equals negative a plus 6i. Now what's wonderful about this is this has turned this into a problem that I know how to do. That on the left hand side is a multiplication problem, right? I can do this. So this is going to be this. This is just like a regular a plus b squared, right? So there's going to be an a squared. But there's not going to be 2ab in the middle, is there? What's going to be in the middle? 2abi. And normally I'd have a plus b squared on the end. But I don't have a plus b squared on the end anymore, do I? I have a minus b squared. Good. Okay, now the cool bit here, and we've done this in quadratic expressions as well, is that now if you have a look at the left-hand side, and you have a look at the right-hand side, these things allegedly are equal to each other, right? Well, the left-hand side has a real part, 
You see that those parts are real? The a squared minus b squared? That has to be real, there's no i's or anything. And the right hand side also has a real bit, right? In exactly the same way, the left hand side has an imaginary bit, and the right hand side has an imaginary bit. And we've established these are like oil and water. If you've got some amount of oil and water over here that's the same as the amount of oil and water over there, the oils must be the same, the waters must be the same. Okay. So, even though I'm just dealing with a simple number, I have unwittingly created some simultaneous equations, right? I'm going to say, comparing the real and imaginary parts, or the components, right? You have a look on the left-hand side, and the real part is a squared minus b squared, yeah? On the right-hand side, comparing it to the same bits, it should be... Negative oh, eight. Right, negative eight. Yeah, that's that's the real part over there. Okay. So this is the first of my simultaneous equations, right? I've got two unknowns, a and b. So I'd better have two simultaneous equations. You knew that, right? If you've got two unknowns, you better have two equations. Three unknowns, three equations. God help you if you have four unknowns. Okay. So here, <laughs> I'm going to compare the imaginary parts. Now, note, right? I could say two a b i equals six i. That would be true. But, but I don't need the I's anymore, right? It's the A's and the B's I'm trying to work with. So all I'm going to say is 2AB is equal to 6. Now, I could designate that as equation 2, but I might as well do a little bit of work with this so that I can actually, you know, solve this. Um, you've got two methods for solving some of these equations. What are they? Elimination. Elimination and substitution. Which one's going to be useful here? Substitution. So I'm going to rewrite this so I can eliminate one of the variables. Uh, I'm going to get rid of B. So if I make B the subject over here, the right hand side will be 6 on 2A, which is 3 on A. Are you okay with that? Yeah? So now that's what I'm going to call equation 2. Okay. Now, this is fairly straightforward. I'm now going to substitute uh, 2 into 1. Okay? So that gives you this awkward looking thing A squared take away what? 3 on A, or squared, yes? Which is 9 on A squared, yep? That's equal to negative 8, let's continue, right? I want to solve this thing, I want to find out what A is, what would you like me to do with it? Uh, there's a couple of different things that I could do and they would all work. Probably the quickest way is to multiply through by A squared, okay? Now that might seem awkward, you're like, oh no, oh no, I don't want... I don't want a quartic, but that's okay. Even though it's a quartic, it's an equation that's reducible to a quadratic, right? So I can just write that as a4 over the 4 plus 8a squared minus 9. In fact, I can straight away factorize this in terms of a squared. Do you agree with that? Can you give me the pair of numbers that adds to 8, multiplies to negative 9? Plus 9. Plus 9 and negative 1. So I'm going to go a squared plus 9. A squared minus 1 equals 0. Now, you know all this fancy stuff about complex factorization now, so it might be tempting to say, aha, I can bring i's in here. But think back, think back. The a and the b are, are these two things, right? A is a real number, right? It has to be. I mean, that's the real part, right? So therefore, one of these doesn't give you solutions. Which one? This one doesn't give you solutions, right? Because a has to be a real number. So I'm going to say a squared minus 1 equals 0 only, right? Since, uh, and this is a bit of a fancy way to say it. You can say a is a real number, but this is just some notation that says the same thing faster. That's a, that e is an epsilon. Um, I'll explain set notation later if you're curious. But that's just another way of saying a is a real number. So there's no real number you can square. Add it to 9 and you get 0. So that gives you no solution. Alright, so what's A? Plus or minus 1. Remember, we're solving an equation, not evaluating an expression. Okay. Now, that's a relief, isn't it? Why is it a relief that I have two answers? Because every non-zero number has two square roots. I better get two values here. Okay. So therefore, a is negative 1 or a equals 1, but of course every value of a will give you a value of b, right? So the negative value, b is going to be equal to negative 3, and um, in this case b is just going to be 3. 
So now I have solved my simultaneous equations. Why was I solving simultaneous equations again? To find the values that would go into my square roots, right? So therefore, z is equal to, there's a positive one, 1 plus 3i, and then there's a negative one. Negative 1 minus 3i. Okay? And depending on the numbers, you know, they didn't have to be all positive or negative, they could have been a mismatch. Um, I can obviously write this as a single number by taking advantage of plus minus notation. And there are my two square roots. I'm done. Okay? If you want to, you can content yourself to actually prove that this is the case by taking 1 plus 3i or taking negative 1 minus 3i and then squaring it and you will see you get negative 8 plus 6i back. Okay?